What's up all my plant lovers? Devin is here with another episode of Plant Vibes TV. And today we're out in the garden. We're gonna be talking about one of my favorite plants that I just planted one, two, three, four, five. I planted about 10 of them just now. Um, th that would be Monarda or Bee Balm. So Bee Balm, it's a member of the mint family, Lamiaceae. So we recognize that as being a plant that's generally quite easy to grow can be a little bit vigorous, um, but the bee balm is a very special plant. You know, I'm, I'm wearing my pollinator friendly shirt right here. List a bunch of different pollinator favorites. Uh, surprisingly, it doesn't list bee balm, but there's a few reasons why I love to grow bee balm. So I wanted to go through them and kind of give some ideas about how to grow them, where to site them in the garden, and just some general care um, and background information on growing Monarda. So Monarda was actually dis discovered uh, by a gentleman, Nicholas Monardes, a, sp um, a Spaniard. Back in the fifth, middle of the 1500s, he arrived in the New World and um, wrote a book describing some of the plants that he discovered uh, through his journeys documenting plants. And one of the plants that he wrote about was now called Monarda, after, after, named after him, Monardes. Um, and so this is a plant, it's native to North America, particularly um, along, like it was discovered along the East Coast up in um, New York. And uh, it was found to be very prevalent in a lot of the Native American, um, Native American communities. It was a plant that they used for many different various kind of healing properties for healing treatments. Um, I was reading one that was quite funny. They used some sort of mixture um, to provide to other Native Americans to reduce excess flatulation. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but not only did the Native Americans use it, it was also kind of a staple of the early American colonial kitchen gardens. Um, the foliage itself would often be used as like a seasoning, a spice. It has a fragrance, a flavor, a reminiscent of like marjoram mixed with oregano. Um, the flavor is a little bit more bitter than like than like oregano might be. So that's why I think it's not really utilized that much. Um, but also the, the foliage would be used in tea. Many of us are familiar with bergamot um, as an ingredient in tea. And uh, bergamot is also one of the names for Monarda. Um, another name is bee balm, which until recently I thought it had, I didn't, I didn't really make the association, but bee balm, um, Imagine you're getting stung by a bee and you take this foliage, you kind of crush it up and you use it as a balm to solve or to help heal those uh, bee bites. Is it a bite? Um, those bee, st bee stings, obviously. Um, and so that's kind of where the name bee balm actually comes from. There's also a whole host of medicinal qualities about the about Monarda, which I'm not going to get into because I'm not, you know, uh, medicinal horticulturalists, there's people that know way more about that stuff than I do. I just like to grow it part for a few different reasons. Number one, the pollinators absolutely love it. Uh, bees, hummingbirds, um, they produce seeds at the end of their flowering period, which provide food for the for the birds. So it kind of, it's a beautiful host for lots of different, um, lots of different pollinators. Now there's a, a handful of different species. I think there's like 15, 16, 17 species of Monarda out there. Primarily there's two main species that are grown in, in the American garden, uh, Monarda didyma and Monarda fistulosa. And a lot of the hybrids are kind of crosses between those two. And so what I actually have is the balmy, um, this is Monarda didyma uh, cultivar. It's, it's the balmy series, and that's what I've planted here. Uh, it's a wonderful plant for kind of a compact growing Monarda. It's only gonna get, you know, maybe 18 inches tall, whereas some of those wild growing didymas or fistulosas can grow much more, you know, maybe three feet tall almost. So this is a much more compact growing variety. Um, and it's also a variety that is listed as being quite mildew resistant. Now that's one of the two reasons why gardeners have um, you know, maybe avoided Monarda in the past is because they can get that powdery mildew and kind of just totally like wipe out a whole section of the garden and that is not very cool. So that's like 
one of the reasons, number one, that gardeners stay away from them. Number two is that they can be rather vigorous. They will spread underground via um, horizontal rhizomes. So they actually like produce roots underneath the ground and the next season those roots will kind of produce top growth and then that kind of creates a nice little clumping patch. Actually, that's why I love it. This is a rather large kind of garden bed, so I want them to produce that beautiful clump. Um, and when you're growing plants for pollinators, it's important to have a lot of flowers. Um, having a nice big section is one of the keys to really encouraging a lot of pollinators to your garden. So I would never grow like one Monarda, unless you know you really have not very much space. I love to produce, or I love to plant in sort of like mass, I would say this is a small mass, but mass plantings, it really can um, attract a lot of pollinators in that way. Now, how do we actually avoid that powdery mildew is super important. You know, we think of powdery mildew, I'll see if I can get some overlays um, to show you what it looks like. Now we think of powdery mildew as something that comes from like, I don't know, like it stays, like your clothes stay moist for too long and then they get that mildewy scent. Um, well, powdery mildew can be spread when humidity on the foliage at night and then it dries out, kind of dries and spreads during the day. Um, that's one way that powdery mildew can occur. Uh, but the primary way that mildew occurs on Monarda is from st stre stress induced from being dry for too long. So it, it gets that stress response from being dry for too long and then it produces this like powdery mildew stuff that looks horrible and you really have to just go and cut it out. So the way to like the best way to avoid that is to really make sure that they stay pretty nice and moist um, almost like all the time. You really don't want to give them long periods of time without moisture particularly when they're in flowering mode, when they're starting to bud up. You know, producing flowers is a pretty stressful process in and of itself, of course. Um, so if you're allowing them to dry out at the same time, you know, other plants, they like to be, they like to, you need to let them dry out for them to induce flowers. These ones, you wanna keep them moist while they're about to flower. Um, that will help keep them looking the best. But really, first and foremost, you know, when you're finding, when you're purchasing your, your Monarda, you really want to get the varieties that do list being mildew resistant. If it doesn't list being mildew resistant, then it's not worth um, growing, all right? So that's really important. Now in terms of siding, so I have suns overhead. It's about one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, this is kind of like a northwest side of the garden. So this typically will get afternoon sunlight here. It gets some morning light and some afternoon light, but it's not like full sun all day long. Um, that's great. You know, you can think of Monarda growing along the banks of a stream underneath the canopy of large trees, and that's kind of its native kind of situation. So trying to replicate that is a good idea. Somewhere where moisture can be available, whether that's you with a watering, which I hope not, or somewhere where maybe like water in my garden starts, just kind of flows this direction. So, it, you know, it's, it's a nice area for that. And, you know, the other thing is Monarda is, is a quite winter hardy plant. I think zone three is winter hardy. They grow it up in Canada. So for most of us here in um, the United States, which are, I think is my primary viewership, uh, this is pretty good for all of the northern, I would say like zone seven to three is a good area. Once you get into like eight, nine, that, those conditions are not really great for Monarda. It's too hot, too humid oftentimes. Well, if it's not too humid, it's just too hot. This plant will prefer less heat than like Georgia, for instance. Okay, so now in terms of spacing them out, you can see I've spaced mine, I don't know, maybe about a foot apart. And after a season or two, these will definitely start to really touch one another and create a beautiful kind of solid mass. Now, these are all of the same series, so they should all grow about the same height. That's pretty important. Um, within, planted within, I have some daffodils, which, uh, you know, those will be done soon. And I'll cut those back just as these Monarda are starting to really start to perk up. Um, the other thing is, as they are clumpers, you can see this guy, you can see how it's kind of created this nice clump like this. Now, as these start to spread from year to year to year, it's super important to go and divide them. I'm um, actually like make a division 
and then replant those divisions because what's going to happen, um, like maybe if you've seen like lavender, which kind of has that bald spot in the middle, the same thing is gonna to happen to Monarda if you don't divide it. To keep the lavender from having that bald spot, you do something completely different, but it's kind of a visual that many of us um, can recognize. You know, you get that center area, which has nothing, and then it's kind of all around um, growth and just looks not good. So you really need to go and divide um, in like the late summer, fall, every three years or so. Dividing is super easy. It's the easiest way to uh, propagate. You really just, I'm not gonna do it right now because I just planted this. I don't wanna divide it now. But really you just take a shovel and you just kinda dig out. I would use a bigger shovel and just kinda go right in the middle. You're not gonna harm it. You're gonna do this in like late summer, fall, after it's already finished flowering. Um, and really you just, then you dig it out and you plant that somewhere else. And by cutting, like cutting it in half or even cutting it in quarters, you're gonna give it some like, uh, you know, a, a little push to regenerate, create new growth. Uh, and that's gonna keep it from getting those bald spots. Hugely important. Now, one other important care point is that after it's kind of done that first flowering in around July, um, you can go ahead and definitely you want to remove the flowers as they're finishing, you know, one by one. But after you kind of notice they've all finished, you can cut the plant back by about a third and that will re regenerate a little bit for the end of the season. You may not get another flush of flowers, but it's definitely worth doing. All right, so I'll just do a quick planting demo. Um, you know, most of you guys are pretty proficient at this. Um, so I have, this is like a two and a half inch pot. It's beautiful. You can see the roots coming right out of it. So first thing, you know, you're gonna have to just cut those roots off. If that's happening, that's that's okay. Cut, just discard that. Um, it's always, you know, really great to have plants that are well rooted when you're potting them up uh, because it's gonna help them. You know, they're in, this, they're in this state of mind, state of growth where they're really like ready to keep growing. Um, so if you, pop it out and you don't have a lot of good root formation, maybe leave it in the container, let it continue to grow in that container until it's really filled out that, can, filled out that pot. That's just kind of an easy tip um, to get the best kind of like transplantation into your garden bed. Um, then of course, oh, this guy looks like he's broken, so I'm gonna just shank him off, that's okay. Maybe I'll make some tea with it. And then always, always break up the roots just like this, super easy. And then just, you know, dig a, I like to kind of just brush the, if you have mulch, kind of brush that aside, because then we're gonna reuse that mulch, of course. Um, brush it aside till you get to the, to like the soil. Um, just make a nice little, nice little well. Plop it in, use your hands. You, I don't know, I like to wear gloves, I forgot my gloves. And I also, it rained pretty hard yesterday, so this soil is nice and moist. I'm not even gonna water it in. If your soil is dry, give it a nice deep watering. Then we have that mulch over here. We just kind of brush it back. If there's any like lower leaves that are touching the mulch, you can go ahead and just kind of get rid of those. It's okay. And voila. Well, I hope you found that video insightful, um, give you some inspiration to maybe add some Monarda bee balm or wild bergamot to your garden beds. Uh, it's a great plant, pollinators love them, I love them. You know, it's full of beauty, um, flowers for a good long time in the, middle of, in the middle of summertime. Definitely a plant worth considering. Um, if you have any further questions, make sure to leave a comment below. I'll definitely respond to it. And if you have any other experiences, any other uh, topics that you would like for me to cover, leave a comment in that. Uh, leave a comment below for those as well. As you know, we post longer form videos like this every Sunday morning and shorter form videos throughout the week. Anyways, I will catch you guys soon. Happy gardening. Ciao.